Hello, 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 everybody. Let me know if you can hear me. Let me see. Can you see me? I'm not sure if you can see me. Put in the chat if that you can hear me or see me, okay? I have the screen share on, so I'm not sure like with the screen share if you can see me or not. I don't know how Zoom works. I'm not understanding quite yet. So, but yeah, so okay, good. Okay, awesome. Okay, okay, good. Okay. All right, well, let's just wait for everybody to come on. I see, okay, Sonia's here, Andrew, Richard. Okay, good. Hey, how's everybody showing up? How was your Easter? Put into the chat how your Easter was, okay? Um, so, uh, what did I do? On Saturday, I uh, went to one of my houses and worked on the yard. And um, on Sunday, uh, we did Easter egg hunting and then it like rained all day. So we just like stayed inside and like just kind of, I went to bed early actually. I was really tired. What did you guys do for Easter? Yeah. Did you have like a virtual Easter? Did you get together with your family? We actually had like virtual meetings and stuff and said hi to everybody for a few minutes. You know, what did you guys do? Tell me what you guys did for Easter. Anything interesting or no? Nothing. Okay. If you can hear me, please write, I can hear you in the chat. And uh, if you can see me, let me know. I'm going to be moving my camera over. I'm going to be, might be moving my camera. Nothing interesting, just cooked. Okay, I can see and hear you good. Christopher said something. All right, Michael, put into the chat where you're from. All right, are you from, what, what what's, uh, city or state are you from? How is everything going over there? Uh, what's the real estate market look like in your area? You know, so kind of just put in the chat, let me know like what's going, like what's going on in your situation over there. Because I know there's people from all over on the, the web, I mean, on the webinar. So let me know what the scoop is in your area. Okay, and just want to make sure you can see, what can you see right now? Can you see the creative deal structuring uh, JPEG? I'm sorry, the creative deal structuring 101 because this, okay, good. Okay, awesome. All right, cool. All right, I see a lot of people showing up. Awesome. Okay. All right, well, I see there's plenty of people on here. So let's get started. Um, Right in the chat, the chat, basically the chat is used for, um, like for you to chat, okay? If you want to chat with your peeps and stuff, be like, yo, what's up? I'm in isolation, I'm dying here. And then you can like chat with all of them in the chat, okay? I'm not going to really pay that much attention to the chat. The Q&A is where you can ask me questions, right? If you have any questions about creative deal structuring or anything like that, then just put them into the Q&A, okay? So we're going to spend like an hour, a little bit over an hour, just going over um, the creative deal structures, and um, and then I can answer any questions, okay? So that's basically how it's for Q&A is for questions. Chat is for chatting. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Uh, and by the way, I'm doing, uh, I'm, I'm doing uh, seven webinars this month, all right? So I'm just going to be teaching everybody all the different things that I feel like you should be learning over the next couple of months, right? So that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing, is like preparing you guys for the next couple of months. So um, today is the only day that I'm doing webinar this week because I'm actually going to be in a conference the rest of the week. I have a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm in a conference. And then Friday, I've got my coaching calls all day. So I'm, I'm not going to be doing anything this week. But then next week, I'm, I think I'm going to do two or three different webinars. So just keep a lookout for those as well and sign up. Come hang out with us. You might as well, right? You're just sitting at home. Put into the chat like where everybody's from and then tell me how long is your lockdown? Right? Are you like till the end of the month? Like Georgia's till the end of the month. What are you guys? Because I know some states are like longer. It's interesting to see like what all the different states are. All right, let's get started here. Uh, okay, let me move these slides here. Okay. Okay, so all right, let's get started. Um, what uh, what we're gonna do today is go over um, all the different types of um, uh, creative deal structures that are out there, right? So we're gonna talk about like what's coming up in the real estate market, the challenges of the market, and why I feel the challenges of, of the market are creating these type of situations. And the situation is that you should be educating yourself and learning about all the different creative deal structures out there. We're gonna be talking about owner financing, lease options 
options and subject to those I think are going to be the three biggies and um, and then if you can really understand and learn these structures you're going to be ready you're going to be ready all right and then the only thing that you have to learn after after learning all these different structures is how to close the deal right because that's the hardest part is closing the deal right convincing the owner that you want to buy their property okay all right so let's get started um first of all let's talk about the real estate market and uh COVID, all right so basically what's going on in the world right now I talk today, I have every Monday, I always have meetings with all my, uh, my, my staff, my employees and stuff, you know, they're all virtually all around the United States and then all around the world, essentially, right? So I've got somebody in India, somebody in Pakistan, I know, sorry, a couple people in Pakistan, somebody in India, um, and then I've got somebody in the Philippines on my team, and then I've got people here in the United States as well. So every Monday, I always have staff meetings and just kind of talk. And we each go, I do one by one, because each one has a different task. And I sat on the, on the uh, you know, I sat on the meeting, and we talked quite a while about what's going on, for instance, in Pakistan, there, it's not, it's not getting better. It's not getting better. The Philippines is not getting better. The, the, the numbers are still rising. Essentially all throughout the world, the numbers are still rising. And what's happening is that the government is, the governments really have no idea what to do. And what they're doing is not helping, right? So I just know that there's something, something is going to happen to the world economy over the course of the next couple of months. And it's not going to be good. All right, it's not going to be good. All right, so we've got to really start honing our skills, really pay attention to the real estate market, because especially if the world economy is going to collapse and all the different countries are going to collapse, the United States is going to have a downfall as well, too, right? So we've got to be strong, number one, you know, to get through this, we've got to use our brains, we've got to be smart. And uh, number two is you've got to educate yourself on all the different things that are coming up and how you can prepare yourself for like, you know, for the different, uh, the, the downfall. All right. So what I feel, and, and uh, I've, I've shown this, this JPEG before, and this is right from Redfin. It's from one of the Redfin articles. And I highly recommend go check out Redfin because they do a lot of really good articles there. It's mostly kind of realtor related, but they do a lot of COVID stuff as well. So go check out Redfin. They've got a whole COVID section. And they really just are looking at the numbers from like a housing point of view, right? So it's very educational if you just keep an eye on it and kind of read the articles every once in a while. But um. Anyways, I love this JPEG, all right, because um, basically it's saying, you know, what kind of an impact, they, they, they uh, did a survey and they surveyed all these people and said, what kind of an impact do you think the coronavirus is going to have on the market, right? Is it going to be bad on the housing market? Is it going to be bad? Is it going to have no effect or is it going to be good, right? And essentially in their like outcome, what they talked about, which was very interesting, was that, you know, the United States is almost divided between good and no effect. I mean, sorry, between bad and no effect, right? They gave very little uh, explanation to the good side of it, right? You know, because from the housing point of view and from realtors point of view, like bad is bad, right? If the economy is going down, they're not gonna be making any money, right? Because nobody's gonna be buying and selling houses. Well, who do you think is in the good section, right? Who do you think saying good? I'm gonna tell you the people that know what they're doing about investing are saying that it's gonna be good, right? So very little people in the United States think that the economy is going to be good over the course of the next couple of years, uh, over the course of the year, whatever, whatever the amount of the survey was. My personal opinion is that the economy is going to be good. I'm super excited. I'm, I'm preparing right now for what's to come and I hope hopefully you guys are doing this as well. And that's what I wanna talk about today is really just, you know, can, like kind of have a mind shift, right? Instead of thinking that the economy is gonna be bad, if, especially if there's not gonna be any effect of all, which is creep, which is a bunch of bull crap, right? But essentially it's gonna be, it's, there's gonna be a huge shift and there's gonna be a lot of things that are changing over the next couple of months. It's not gonna be as bad as it was, cross your fingers, you know, nobody knows, but like cross your fingers, it won't be as bad as the bubble was. But there's going to be a downturn and it's a much deserved downturn anyways, because I mean, the real estate market is, a, is an eight year cycle, right? And it's already year 12. So, 
as you guys already know, like we are, we should be in a recession and we're not. So we had a very good run. Awesome, right? We got a good run. Now all the newbies that are coming in right now, don't get scared about this, right? Because you actually make your money in the downturn anyways. So all you have to do is just kind of understand that the market is an eight year cycle and we were in 12 year 12 and now we're going into a downturn. And the downturn doesn't mean anything except for you're going to be doing different kinds of strategies than you would be doing in the, in the upturn. And that's it. Just know your strategies and know what you have to do and you'll be fine. All right. And just be smart about the type of transactions that you do. Okay. And being smart means being educated. I'm going to use this button here, I think, or I might be able to just touch this. All right, so as you know, right, I mean, if you look at the stats, I was looking at the stats today just to prepare for tonight, and I mean, um, it's not looking good, right? I mean, there are showings, and I talk to realtors, and I talk to realtors all the time. I, talk, I had a couple of realtors that I talked to on Saturday, and they're like, oh, no, no, we're getting showings. We're getting, so we're doing virtual showings. But, and then I said, well, like, is it a lot? And they said, oh, no, no. I was like, is it, how much is it before and now? I was like, oh, it's, it's not good. It's not, there's not a lot of showings. So yeah, people are saying like, we're getting showings. We're getting virtual showings. Awesome, right? But it just doesn't compare to what it was in the past couple of months. But the truth of the matter is, is that honestly, from March, I mean, we were declining in, 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 getting houses on the market anyways we were declining in getting showings either anyways we were declining in the price you know price drops were getting worse and worse i mean the market was essentially over the course of the last six months not doing very well anyways right so so now you just know that you know you just got to be ready for what's to come So basically, in my personal opinion, what's to come is that you're going to be able to, to get deals on houses that you couldn't even probably imagine right now that you're going to be able to get if you know what to do, right? It's time for you to be creative. It's time for you to think outside the box. It's time for you to start thinking about not not thinking about cash for houses, right? I mean, you're probably, you're going to get cash for house. You can get cash for houses, right? But the more creative that you are in your, your deal structuring and the more creative that you are um, with, you know, how you talk to sellers and how you negotiate with sellers, the more deals you're going to be able to do, right? So what we want to learn today, what we fo want to focus on today is how we can buy houses for very little money, right? How we can buy houses. And I mean, people over, even on the upturn, people were buying houses for, you know, for little or no money. But, um, uh, and you know, I talked to a very good investor um, the other day and they were telling me that they were telling me, I've been buying like houses for, you know, very little money because I don't have any money. Right. So like essentially I had to be creative in coming up with deal structuring in order to get those houses. And it, re it really made me think out beside the box, but even in the upturn, they were doing the creative deal structuring. So this is something that this is the kind of structuring that you can learn about and really do at any time in any type of market. Right. But for some reason in a downturn, this is like the most prevalent kind of strategies that you're going to hear from. Right. So let's learn how we can buy houses with little or no money, right? That's the best thing. Let's make some deals, right? Let's get out there and make some deals. And let's, and the thing is, is what I'm going to talk about today is how to make lots and lots of offers that are not just cash offers, right? So what I teach my students and what I, I've been teaching for many years is the five offer system. Every single house that we, every single house or every single property that I've ever done, I give like a gazillion different strategies that say, look, well, what about this? Okay, well, what about this? Okay, what about this? And it's all about about how you negotiate it's all how, how how you how you talk to the seller and how you just say look like I'm not gonna give you just a cash offer because you know that one that might not be the best offer for you instead I'm gonna give you several different offers okay so that's what we're gonna talk about is how you can make deals how you can make different offers and once you you understand these strategies strategies you should be able to to um, to go out and maybe even try some I remember when I first started all right. I remember when I first started, uh, you know, like my very first, I've literally, I remember the very first person that called me from the, from the direct mail that I sent out. 
I had no idea what I was talking about. No idea what I was doing, but I just like bull crap the whole thing, right? And I was like, okay, well, let me come see your house. And so I did. I came out, I saw the house, and I took some notes, and you know, I did my repair estimate. And I said, okay, well, is it okay if I come back maybe in the next day or two and I'll give you three or four or five different offers? And they were just like, what? And I was like, yeah, I wanted to give you like a couple of different offers, not just the cash offer, but maybe some, I have some other ideas. And it was a house that was free and clear, you know, so it was kind of, it was a kind of a good thing. And I went, I just like, and I literally had no idea what I was doing, but I had created like this offer system. It was my very first deal. And I gave him like five different offers and I brought it back and sat down with him. And he was just like, I can't believe you're giving me five offers. And I was like, that's what I do. You know, I was like, yeah, that's what I do. And I was like, oh my God, this is my very first offer. I have no idea what I'm doing right now. In my mind, that's what I was thinking. Anyway, so you can, you can give as many offers as you want, right? So basically, what is going to happen over the next couple months? Nobody knows. I have no idea. Everybody's speculating. We have no idea what's going to happen, right? But I do know that I'm not going to stop looking for properties. I'm not. I'm going to keep contacting sellers. I'm not going to give up. I know that I'm going to be focusing on passive income because right in the downturn, you want to be focusing a lot more on passive income and especially with these creative deal structures, right? Especially with these creative deal structures you will be able to acquire houses for little or no money down. So it's like, why not keep them for yourself? You know what I'm saying? So like, you know, and I teach all my students, how about like, you know, wholesale one or two or three and keep one, right? Or wholesale one or two and keep one and kind of keep, come up with a little strategy that works best for you. Sometimes you need some cash, totally get that, right? But also, if you're going to be coming up with totally awesome deals and getting and getting offers out, you want to make sure that you keep some of those too. And I know that we're going to get through this, right? So please, like, just um, keep the mindset that we're going to make it through it. We've been making it through it in all of in all of history, and we're going to make it through it again now. Okay. So, what do you? My personal opinion is what you should be focusing on right now, right? So, what? what I think you should be focusing on right at this very moment, right, is to get your credit in order, right? Cash is going to be keen right now. I've talked to many lenders and they're like, if you've got equity in your house or anything like this, just as long as you know you, you're going to be able to pay that money, like if you pull my equity out of your house or whatever you're going to do, you have to be able to pay that on, on a monthly basis, right? Just as long as you know you can afford to pay that, then, you know, why not take out, you know, you know, get money out of your house or whatever you need to do. So, um, like, and especially now that all the interest rates are so low. Oh my gosh, they're like ridiculous. Now, the only thing is that, and everybody wants to cash out refi right now, right? Everybody does. So the, is, the issue is that it's going to take a little bit longer to close, right? So if you are thinking, yeah, I do have some money in a house or a couple houses that I want to just offload, the issue right now is just, being able to close because the lenders are so backed up with the PPPs and the, and all the cash out refis and like, you know, people just are going nuts about, about the money right now because they, you know, in their mind, they just need to have cash in order to live or whatever it is. So get your credit in order so you can borrow money if that money is available to borrow. Number two, get your cash in order if you have any cash. And number three, talk to all lenders, right? and make sure and see which ones are going to be lending and which ones aren't. I'm going to tell you, uh, most of the lenders are not going to be lending. So the ones that you think are going to be lending, make sure that you talk to them. Don't put your eggs in the basket. Now, I was just talking to uh, someone earlier that has money, that has a, um, a line of credit from a bank, right? And it's just like a typical bank. You know, it's like one of these like banks out here or whatever. It's like, it's, it's a local regional bank. It's like a regional bank, but it's not like, it's not like a Wells Fargo, but it was like a regional bank. And she was like, I don't know if the money's going to be available. And I said, you know what? Banks are going to get bailouts. The only way that a bank can make money is, is, is if it lends money. That's it. All right. So banks are going to be lending. They want to lend your money out, right? So when they're going to get, but that's going to get a bill out because that's just how it works, right? So essentially if you have a good bank you should be fine but if you're going to like 
some broker, hard money lender, you know, 1-800-FAST-CASH or whatever, like, I'm going to tell you that a lot of these people, a lot of these companies are working with other companies that are working with other companies that are borrowing out of the hedge funds or whatever, right? So you have to make sure that your lenders are viable. You have to make sure that, you know, they're going to last, you know, over the course of time. You don't want to be like halfway through and then they say, oh yeah, sorry, your money's gone or whatever, you know, because this happens. So you got to, you got to check out your lenders and make sure they're going to last. And then also you want to learn to it. You want to learn to invest in real estate. Now is the time to learn, right? Because this time next month, you know, who, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be even more nuts than what it is right now. I mean, I was looking at charts on Atlanta. I mean, over the course of the last uh, month, I mean, like the rate of even listings or listings are up, like are down like 20%. People to go to look at houses are down 20%. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to get even worse. There are some cities I was looking at that are like 50%, you know, so it's going to be very interesting to, you know, so keep an eye on how those markets, especially in other cities, like if you're interested in going into other cities, definitely keep your eye on those markets because there are a couple of cities that they've already dropped like you know it's dropped like 50 percent already so and then join a community of like-minded individual and individuals to keep you on track you know me i own the south Anaria, so you know you'll have a group of people that you can you can you can lean on you know if you're in a different state or wherever you're at then please Make sure that you join ARIA so that you can have that community that you can bounce ideas off and maybe partner with or share, you know, share, uh, you know, uh, deals or whatever you need to do, right? That's what the, that's what it's for. Okay. Oops, I went the wrong way. Okay. So basically what I wanted to say is even though all that is happening, you're in the right place, right? Because I'm here. I want to help you. I love teaching people how to invest in real estate. Um, you know, I love, I love seeing everybody do deals. I get I, every, you know, every week I get um, people, people from the South and arena saying, oh, I got my first deal, you know, for the members or like even my coaching students are doing deals. So I love this. I love helping others. I've been in the, in the real estate market for almost 10 years now, right? I came right out in 2010, right out of the bubble. So I haven't been in a downturn yet. So I'm, I'm excited about going into the downturn because I feel like I'm armed and ready, right? But um, I've done over a, a hundred re uh, rehabs um, over the course of the last five or so years. Um, I've completed several hundred transactions in the last 10 years. I've taught hundreds and hundreds of students just like you over the last five years. And I love teaching people how to invest in real estate. And I've, I've invested in all different kinds of transactions. So I can at least help you to uh, keep you on track, keep you moving, answer any questions that you have, okay? This is me, as you can see, this is my family. It's Lillian and Pete. We live uh, in, a, in a tiny home up in the mountains. We actually, um, last year, we sold everything that we have and we just moved, you know, all of our things. We moved into a little tiny house, um, you know, just because we wanted to get rid of all bills and prepare ourselves, you know, just prepare. So, and um, we, let, we, uh, we make our money off of storage facilities and um, we do some real estate transactions. I'm doing a rehab right now. But um, I try not to do many rehabs because it's too much work, right? The more that you invest, the more the, the more you invest, the more you think like, okay, how can I make money without doing very much work, right? So that's kind of my goal is like, how can I make money in real estate investing without with doing very little work? And so those are the kind of transactions I do. And that would mean like owner financing. I do a lot of owner financing deals. Um, and, uh, and I love, uh, and I love storage facilities. Y'all know that. All right. So this is how the market looked over the course of the last 10 years, right? This is how the market looked. And this isn't, this is how basically how I felt. So once I got in right to the market, I was like, I was on the upswing, man. I was doing awesome. Right. I was so excited. And then I got all the way to the top. And then I was just like, wow, there's so many like hands in the basket. This is like crazy. I can't even find any good deals anymore. Right. So low opportunity and high risk, right. Right at the top of the, uh, 
top of the uh, the market and then guess what now it's starting to go down and so now it's like okay you got to start preparing for what's to come you got to start in, in investing and in, in buy and hold you've got to really understand creative deal structuring you can still wholesale if you want but it's going to be a lot of stuff that's like buy and hold turnkey um, storage facilities these kinds of things which you're going to be focusing on now and then or short sales right you're going to see a lot of short sales coming up as well um, and then low risk and then all the way down at the bottom you see low, this is the lowest risk so we're heading on the downturn now so my question to you is where are you on this chart right are you going into the denial a lot of people were in the denial they're like no no recession's coming it's awesome remember oh, oh yeah no 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 you know so that was the denial and then it's like oh shit oh my god now it's really coming now what do i do you know and now it's like and then if you don't start preparing now you're going to get into the panic mode right we don't want to be in the panic y'all we want to be like in this area the denial area we want to be arming ourselves and getting ready you know for what's to come so okay and this is just this is the type of rehab just put in a couple of houses this is the type of rehabs that i did i didn't do like huge big rehabs like my average rehab was around fifty thousand dollars or less so I would buy like little ha like houses like this and then just make it into this, right? So that's the kind of rehabs I did. So I didn't really ever do guts. I didn't do big, I didn't do additions. I've done them before, but this just wasn't my cup of tea, right? I didn't, I like to do the in and out easy stuff, right? Cause you know, I'm like I said, like I do make the most amount of money with the least amount of work, right? So that's kind of my style. And then of course, now you know, I invest in storage facilities, right? So that's kind of my thing. Um, and I love finding abandoned storage facilities. These are the ones that this is like hiding in a forest that nobody ever can find. And then somehow we find those and then we contact the owner and we buy them from them for very, very little money. Okay, so now let's get into the type of real estate transactions that are out there. All right, so um, uh, these are, this is all the different types of transactions that you could invest I, out of my mind that I could think of that you can invest in. If you can think of something else, then like put your, um, put your, like whatever you think into the chat. Cause I was, I was trying to see if I could come up with stuff, but essentially rehabbing, wholesaling, performing notes and non-performing. And actually in the downturn, you're going to be learning or you're going to be seeing more and more stuff about notes and performing. Cause this is kind of more of like a downturn kind of thing too. It's like performing notes and non-performing notes. I cannot really teach on that cause I've never done, I have held notes before, but I'm not a broker or anything like that. But anyways, you'll hear a lot more about notes lease options subject to lending lending you'll still be able to do all right and you can do that in an upturn and a downturn right crowdfunding turnkey and turnkey or rentals um storage facility assisted living don't do assisted living right now all right that's kind of a no-no commercial is going to be like commercial like office buildings kind of a no-no right now right multifamily, virtual wholesaling, remote rehabbing, owner financing, wraps, self-directed IRA, vacation rentals, sandwich lease options, signage, mobile homes, mobile home parks, tax lien and land, right? So essentially all of these are all prevalent when it de in a, depending on what time of the market we're in right so you're, you're going to say like all some of this stuff is on the upturn and some of this stuff is on the downturn right and that's what you've got to learn when do you do what on the out, downturn and when do you do a stuff on the upturn okay so what we're learning right now is we're learning about what we can do on a what on a like on a downturn now actually these are types of uh, structures that you can do really anytime but it's more just more prevalent during this time like i said okay so lease options and sandwich lease options right so basically a lease option we're going to get into a uh, we're going to get into like a visual on this i'll just go through kind of what it is a lease a uh, lease option is a lease with an option to purchase right a property owner and a tenant agrees at the end of the rental period, the renter has the option of purchase the property, right? So you're leasing it with the option to purchase, okay? Usually there's an option fee included in the price. The option fee is like non-refundable. It's not a deposit, it's an option fee, okay? 
okay? It doesn't go towards the mortgage, right? It's just like, okay, $5,000 moves you in and then you pay, you know, for, you know, 18 months or two years. And after two years, then you can buy the house if you want to kind of a thing, okay? And then a sandwich lease option is when you do a lease option and then the party, so the party rents the property from the, the property owner and then he leases it, leases it out to another tenant, right? The property, the primary property is both either a leasee or a lessor and both collect rent and pay rent. Okay, so let me get, and I'll get into a visual on this. Um, the party that's subletting what is already, the party is subletting what is already being sublet. All right, so it's really like double subletting is what it is. The party signs a long-term lease on a piece of property that is, but is now looking to vacate. Okay, so let's get into a visual of how this looks. And if you have any questions, then just put them into the Q and A. Yes, okay, yes, this meeting is being recorded. Um, if you signed up, you get the replay. Uh, Donna says, looks like a big tiny house. Well, I mean, it's 500 square feet. So it's kind of not like a normal tiny house, but yeah, it's 500 square feet. Um, okay. And let's see, let's go to the next slide is, okay, so here's my little drawing that I made. <laughs> Hopefully y'all can understand this. Okay, <clears throat> lease option and seller lease option. Okay, so now you have the seller and the seller has a house, right? And let's just say that the seller wants to, uh, to sell the house or uh, lease the house out for, um, or sell it for $100,000, okay? Let's just say, you know, he wants to sell it for $100,000. You go to the seller. Okay, essentially, and you say, hey, would you be interested in a lease purchase or a lease option purchase? Okay, and they say, well, what is that? And you say, well, what if I, what if I say I will buy the house in two years and I will, um, and I will lease the house from you, let's say for $1,200 a month. Okay, and if you do this, I'll give you $5,000 right now. All right. And basically that's kind of what you do is you basically convince the seller to do an, a lease and the lease could be, you know, a year or two or three or five years. I mean, whatever you want to do, any extended amount of time. And then the purchase is on the back end, right? The option to purchase is on the back end after the lease is up. Okay. And the, and the deposit can be any amount, it could be 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, whatever the seller, whatever you and the seller agree to. So there's a lot of negotiables, obviously, in, in a lease option, right? Okay. Now this, the sandwich lease option, basically, if you, if you, if you remember from the last slide, is when you have a lease option, right? So the seller says, yeah, let's do it. Like I'll do 5,000 down, 1,200 a month for two years at $100,000. And you can, you can buy it in, in, in a, a, for $100,000 in two years or before. You can say, oh yeah, I might, I might buy it earlier. You know, I, mean, I don't know. So then what the buyer does is the buyer goes out and finds another buyer, right? And the buyer basic, and the, you convince the buyer, say, look, Okay, I have a house here. I'm going to sell it to you for $110,000. All right, and I'm going to give you, but you can lease it out for, you know, for 18 months at, um, at you know, $1,500 a month. Okay, but I require for you to do this $10,000 down. All right, so now you've got these two, uh, you've got these two options, or you've got these two options. So basically, when you put five thousand, you put five thousand to the seller, and guess what? That ten thousand dollars, you get to you get to pocket five thousand dollars yourself. Okay, and then you you had a, a lease with this guy for eighteen months, and you have a lease with this one for for two years, right? So that means that you have six months in between to you know to they're either going to buy the house if they want at one hundred and ten thousand, and if they decide no, I don't want to buy it, well you have six months to to find a you know to either find a buyer or um, back out, right? Or ask for another extension, right? It's, it's kind of your three options. All right. So essentially what happens is, is in the sandwich lease option, you're going to find the buyer, right? And you're going to pocket $5,000. You're going to sign, you're going to sign a lease for 18 months, and then you're going to sign, and it's two different contracts, right? It's two different contracts. So you have one contract that is your lease and one contract that is your purchase. So you can't combine them. It's two different, all right? 
One is your purchase and one is your lease. And you just have to make sure that the numbers are, you know, match up for both of them. And in the end, you can just essentially make $10,000 off of this $100,000 house that you bought or, you know, and make, you make 5,000 on the front end and 10,000 on the back end. And then you make $300 a month of rent every single month. Okay, does that make sense? All right, let me know in here. Um, what questions you have on that. Let me know, does that make sense? Say yes or no, so I can make sure y'all are on the same page with me with the, with the lease option and the sandwich lease options, okay? So um, I have a question. It says, what type of contracts are needed from the seller? You need two contracts, right? So you need the, le the lease and the purchase. The lease and the purchase is what you need. So you're gonna lease it like you're gonna rent it and then you're gonna purchase. And the purchase is gonna be an option. Right? It's not going to be like an actual purchase and sale. It's going to be an option. So really you need a lease and an option. Okay. A lease and an option. Makes sense. Got it. Any other questions? Ooh, I got lots of questions here. Okay. Have you done this for four? Yes, it's legal. It is legal. Yes, it's legal. Everybody does this. I, I, I don't know about every single state. I'm sorry. You have to find out in your own states, but essentially in Georgia, it's totally legal. In fact, I had like, I lived in a house uh, in Peachtree City right next to me. That person was doing the lease option and we talked about it. And I was like, oh, cool. Cause then I was like, oh, I know about that now. Um, so that was like 10 years ago, but yeah, so people buy with, with options to purchase all the time. And just as long as you let the buyer, the owner, the seller know, you know, it's just basically like subletting, but yes, this is completely legal. Um, uh, can you make the slides available? Of course I can make the slides available. Uh, when you get the, uh, when you get the, the replay, you're going to have the slides. Okay. And also this is just, a uh, this is um this is live streamed on youtube right so you can go to youtube as well and just go to stacy rossetti teaches that's my youtube page it's brand new right but i have like seven webinars almost on there now right and i'm trying to live stream stream all of them so you can just go right on to my youtube page and you can watch any one of the webinars but we're still trying to figure that out so just kind of like bear with us but um you can find them there too Um, okay, let's see. Why do you only lease to the new buyer for 18 months? You can do two, you can do two years if you want. You can do two years. You can use, you can do a year. I mean, it's basically how long you want to take, but the thing, you know, you want to have the lease for, but essentially like just in case, like they come up to the two years and they're just like, no, then you're going to go to the seller and be like, no, I like to give a little bit of buffer just so I can be like, okay, like, what am I going to do? Like, if they just say no, it gives me a little bit of time to uh, you come up with an exit strategy, right? So, you know, but you can do two years if you want to do two years and just, but then that just doesn't give you a buffer. You could do like 20 months or whatever, or 22 months and say, okay, look, like I need 22 months. That gives me two months to be like, if you say no, I can go back and renegotiate with them or whatever I need to do. That's what I like to do. I like to give a little bit of buffer. Okay, should I pay the mortgage company directly or pay the seller? You're paying the seller, so you're renting. Remember, you're renting, so you're just paying the seller on this one. So this is not an owner finance. We'll get to owner financing, which is different. Actually, we'll get to, so you're talking about subject too. So, we'll, and actually, we'll get to both of those in just a second, right? But this is like, you just lease it and you just rent the place out. It's a rent to own. It's basically rent to own is what it is, right? Does that make sense? Who, so who ultimately owns the house? In the end, it's right now the seller is owning it, right? The seller is owning it and you have the option to buy it in two years or three years or five years, whatever you negotiate, okay? So the seller owns it, right? This is not subject to and this is not owner financing. This is just lease option. Exactly what it says, it sounds like is what it is, okay? My YouTube page is Stacy Rossetti teaches. Stacy Rossetti teaches. The final purchaser, what, Chris? Oh, so who ultimately owns? Oh, no. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. So ultimately in the end, yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. Okay. Ultimately in the end, the new buyer, well, let's just do two things. If it was just a lease option, the buyer is going to own it in two years, right? But if it was a sandwich lease option, the new buyer is going to own it in two years. 
So you're basically just that middle person that's, and I've done, I've done a couple of these and essentially in the end, like they just, either they just wanted to keep, either they either just closed it and bought it or they were like, man, out and then I would have to do it. So one house, like I did a lease option on, and um, like, I think it turned over like three, like three times, right? And three times I was like, okay, well, I gotta go. They were just like, no, I don't wanna buy, right? And then I had to go out and find another person to come in because I had had a option for like five years on that property. And so, after, and I did like, I did like 18 months. I think I did 18 months options on the sandwich side. And so then after 18 months, they were like, no, we don't wanna buy. So I just had to go out and then find another buyer what I had to do right and I think it turned over and then on the third time and finally like they bought it and I was like thank you and I made a little extra cash but then the thing is is every time that somebody moved out I was just like yeah all right well I'll just get another five thousand dollars right and that's what I would do is do like a five thousand dollar deposit down right and uh and then I would so every single time it had turned over I got that five thousand dollars so for me for them to move out it was kind of like eh. and the thing is is that the difference between owner financing and lease option though is that it is a rental right so your rent this person is renting it from you so like when they moved out like when these people moved out essentially like I had to go in and kind of clean the place up you know what I'm saying like I had to go in and maybe like you know just clean it up and like sometimes you know, maybe fix a couple things or whatever, you know, so, but, uh, but you have to remember that they're renting from you. So like these renters are not going to go in and clean the house. I mean, fix the house up. Now, if you do owner financing, it's different, right? But, um, but not for lease options. Okay. And this is not, this is, this is not a free and clear. It does not have to be free and clear on this. Essentially the seller just wants to make sure that they're, they're making enough money to pay the mortgage. The seller is just making sure that they have, so their mortgage may be $1,000 a month or something on this house or $900 a month. And they're make, they could probably be making money as well too. So let's just say the mortgage for the seller is $900. You rent it out for $1,200. I mean, you rent it to them from them for $1,200 and you rent it out for $1,500 or whatever it is. And you just have to figure out what the rent, essentially what you have to do is figure out what the rent can go for in the area. You know what I'm saying? That's all you have to, it's really have to do. And so can you make money on the rent? And sometimes you don't really, sometimes you don't make that much money on the rent. You know what I'm saying? Maybe a hundred or a couple hundred dollars, you know, but you're, then what you do is you can make the sell price 115,000 say, okay, well, I know that if they close, I'm going to make 15 grand on this house. So for me to make a couple hundred dollars is okay or whatever. That's kind of how you think about it. But you do want to make sure that you have enough money to pay like, um, you know, like, you know, if something comes up, you know, but they, but you are renting from it. So if like the HVAC goes out, the seller pays it, right? Not you, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Also, do you have to go to the seller to sign an agreement to allow the buyer? To, you, I, you, you kind of, I would really be like, uh, there's a lot of people that don't do that, honestly. But the thing is, is that like, you know, be honest. I say, look, like, I'm going to, you know, this is just what I'm going to do. I know exactly, like, I'm gonna, I know uh, exactly who's going to move into this place. I'm going to be one that's managing it. So you're managing it, right? Um, and you just have to, like, I would just be honest with the seller on what you're going to do, okay? My personal opinion. Um, did you carry any type of insurance on the property? Yes, I do carry insurance on my properties, all my properties. I just do because it's, you're liable, essentially. If something happens, then you have the contract. So I would get I would get some insurance on the property as well too, just to just to protect yourself. I always, anyways, I've had liability insurance since like day one. So I just have liability insurance because I know I'm doing like risky investments. So I just pay for it. It's not very expensive. Liability insurance is like maybe thousand dollars a month or something. I mean, I'm sorry, thousand dollars a year, eight hundred dollars a year or something like that. Um, it's like business liability. All right. So this like, you can go and talk to an insurance person and be like, okay, like this is exactly what I do. And it's a business policy to just protect you is what it is. Um, you know, you can talk Richard Rose is like for the South Lanaria. Richard Rose is our insurance guy. There's Mike Lowry is an insurance guy. So you can talk to them if you, if you're, if you go to southlanaria.com, those two people are in the vendors directory. Uh, those are in Georgia. So if you're outside of Georgia, talk to somebody that offers business insurance. Okay. Business liability. 
So what happens if the property value is more than 100K at the end of the lease? Does the, does the buyer get to keep the equity? Well, you have the property, you have it under contract for 100, you have it under contract for $110,000, right? So that's what you're going to sell it for. So even if it went up to, even if it went up to $150,000 property, essentially you have it under contract for this much, you know what I'm saying? So that's really all you can get out of it. So you have to make sure that you kind of run your numbers and say, okay, like, I'm guessing that it's going to be around this much. You know, I know I can make, you know, a hundred, I know I can make 15,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 on this house, right? So you're running comps based on when you're going to sell it. Will that be double insurance owner and you? So owner's going to have like homeowner's insurance, right? That's what the insurance that the owners can be, you know, and the renter would have like rental insurance. You, I would personally have business liability insurance, right? So just in case something happens and you get sued, you're covered, right? And you can talk, as I said, talk to an insurance person on exactly what you need because, you know, it could be in this situation, it could be di uh, different as well too. But yes, I always have insurance. I was like, I, if you don't know any of my webinars, y'all know I spend so much money on insurance. Such a scam, such a scam. But in this investing world, you got to be insured. You got to be insured. I probably spent like, I remember one year I spent like 50 grand on insurance. Oh my gosh. Anyways, so I'm insured. That's, that's how it is. Okay, um, let's see what else. Just remember that if you have questions, they need to go in the Q&A. I am not monitoring the chat. I'm only monitoring the Q&A, okay? Chatting is for chatting and Q&A is for questions, at least for me, okay? Keeps me like sane. Okay, let's go over subject two, all right? Let's go over subject two. So, now the subject two, everybody's always asking, how do you do subject twos? Okay, so essentially, basically what happens, and I'll go over this slide, and then I have a kind of like a different slide that we'll go over as well too. So the buyer will acquire property and take over the payments of an existing mortgage, right? The seller and the buyer will make an agreement and the seller will hand over the payment booklet to the buyer, right? So the, the, the buyer is making payments on the mortgage. They are not assuming the mortgage. They are just making the payments of that mortgage and that mortgage is staying in place, okay? There is no new mortgage. Subject twos are often used when the seller is behind on their mortgage, all right? You are responsible, I, mean, I was gonna say, behind on your mortgage, oh, all right, because like a lot of these people that are not paying over 30, 60, 90 days, I mean, if this Forbearance Act passes, then they can forbear that to the end of the year and just add three more payments onto the end of their 30-year ter term or whatever. But if that does not pass, which I don't know if it pass or not, because I know they're talking about it, but essentially if that doesn't pass, then, then essentially what's gonna happen is in 90 days, they're gonna be like, oh yeah, mortgage is due. You know what I'm saying? So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. If anybody's heard on that, post it on the chat because I've been trying to pay attention to it. You are responsible for the payments of the loan. Okay, so you, me, as in the buyer, I am responsible for the payments of the loan. The seller will deed the property to you. So they literally hand the property over to you, right? And you will be uh, the owner of the home right? So you'll be the owner. Mortgage stays in the seller's name and the buyer purchases a property subject to the existing mortgage. So that's why it's called subject to, right? Buyers purchase a property subject to the existing mortgage. Now, if you think that you have a property that is sub a subject to or like a lease option or a um, owner finance deal, okay, these types of transactions, I highly recommend that you use an attorney to close these types of deals, right, to protect you and the uh, seller. All right. And basically, if you have a subject to deal and you go to like a traditional like lender that like doesn't really look what, look with investors very much, they're just going to be like, oh, well, I don't know if you can do that or not. All right. So just go to somebody like Josh Rand is like, you know, and he, you know, who else, if you can think of anybody else in Atlanta, put it in here. But like, you know, somebody that knows what they're doing with uh, transactions 
uh, with these types of transactions. Okay, so what's going to happen? The attorney is basically going to call the seller up and say, like, okay, so I'm going to put the papers together for this deal. I just want to make sure you completely understand, right? That you know the the buyer is going to start making the payments of your mortgage for you. Bring everything current. Make the mortgage. Do you understand this? And they're going to say yes. They're going to sign documents that say yes. They understand this. Okay, basically is what's going to happen. Okay, so that's basically what a subject two is. So let's go to my next slide. Um, subject two. Okay, so the same property that we have for sale for a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, I mean, so basically, what's going to happen is you're going to send out your marketing, right? And you're going to you're going to contact like a, a pre foreclosure list or a foreclosure list or what it is. And a lot of the times, these are the type of deals that come up, right? And so what's going to happen is that let's just say that this person that has this $100,000 house owes a mortgage of $900 every single month and they haven't paid it for three months and now they're behind and like essentially they only make enough money to live and survive and pay one month and that's it. And like, you know, which is like typically everybody in the United States, right? So I think 50% of Americans live like paycheck to paycheck, right? So essentially they just can't, they're not going to be able to get caught up and it's starting to like cause them stress and it's getting their credit, is, their credit hasn't really been that good anyways. And so like, it's just like, it's just not going to work out, right? It's just not going to work. And maybe they want to downsize and get out. Okay. So, and um, so when you go to the house, basically you look at it, you're going to see like, okay, it also, on top of that, it also needs work because it hasn't been updated in, you know, 30 years or whatever. Right. And the seller just wants out. Basically, the seller wants out, you know, and so when and these these types of properties are really good when the seller is like, or you you can get them in all type of situations, but essentially like when the seller is behind on their payments, that's going to be the big kind of key. And then number two is like, maybe um, it's just kind of like it there what they owe is what it's worth. Right. So it's kind of neck and neck. Like so now if they're upside down. Right. If they're upside down, let's just say it's worth, you know, um, a hundred and it's worth, you know, fifty thousand dollars and they owe a hundred thousand dollars or whatever, then like they're upside down. So that's going to be a short sale, which I think over the course of the next six months or so, you're going to see that really coming up a lot as well, too. Not quite right now, but it'll be more and more. And um, so, but with these types of transactions, a lot of times you're going to see they're behind on their taxes, their back taxes aren't paid. Um, they're, you know, they're taxed, they have maybe liens on their property, maybe they have two mortgages on their property, right? A lot of times they have two mortgages on their property, um, you know, and then like, or they owe money on their property and they're, they owe like mortgage on their property, like three, four, five months and they just can't, they can't get caught up. All right. So what you have to do as the buyer is you have to, you have to be able to bring money to the table. All right. So if they're back three, four or five months, then you have to bring that money to the table and make their loan current, number one. And that's what you tell them, like, OK, like I'm going to save you. All right. I'm totally going to save you. I have the best idea. And this is the idea I want to. I'm going to just bring your, your mortgage current. I'm going to come out of pocket myself. And I'm going to bring it current. Right. So I'm going to come out of pocket three grand or whatever they need in order to get them current. And then I said, but the only thing that you have to do is you have to, you have to keep the loan in your name and then I'm going to just start making those payments for you. All right. I'm going to make them every single month and um, we're going to keep the loan in your name. All right. But, but you'll just, you can just deed the property right over to me. Like if you want out, I'll take over. I mean, I will, I'll take over, but you know, but you got to deed that property to me. And then you have to, you have to let me make payments in your name for at least one year or two years or three years. Now, I personally don't feel like you should be doing subject to for like long, extensive time, right? But you can do it for a little, a year or two or three years, you know, but like, you don't want to be like, all right, for 10 years or five years or something like that, you know, you just want to have an exit strategy as you, as what you want. Okay. So, and so basically, so, and then what you can do is you'll start, you'll bring that money. So you'll have to have money to come out of pocket, right? And some people are like, you know, five or 10 or 15 or $20,000, you know, back on their mortgages. Like they just haven't, you'll get this, right? They just like, I'm just out. Right? I haven't paid anything in like six months. And my mortgage was like, you know, $1,800 a month, you know? So you'll have to bring that money current. 
okay bring that mortgage current and then on top of that what you're going to be doing is uh, making you're going to have to be able to make that payment every single month on time on time right because what could happen is if you start getting behind on your payments the, the lender would call the loan due and you don't want them to call the loan due. You want them to have any reason to call them the loan due. Now, it doesn't really typically happen unless you start getting like behind on your payments and stuff, you know? So, and then what you want to do, and then you'll just, and then what happens is the attorney is going to close it, and then you're going to get the deed, all right? And then you find somebody to rent that place out. Number one, one option is that you could find somebody to rent that place out. Okay. And uh, let's just say that the mortgage was $900 a month and you found somebody for like, you know, $1,300 a month. All right. So you have like $400 a month that you're going to make every single month on that property for the next year or two or three years. Okay. However long you want to do the, 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 um, the rental for. And then, um, or what you could do is you could actually rehab, if, you, if the house needed work, you could rehab the house and then you could just put it on the market. All right. And so if the mark, if you, if you rehab it and then you can make money on the back end, you can do a subject two for a rehab as well too. Right. And the good thing about doing a subject two for a rehab is that you don't have to come up, come up with any money for the purchase of the property. All you do is come up with money for the uh, rehab right now. You have to come up with money for the rehab and there's not really a lot of lenders out there that will just do a rehab because you already have a first lien on, on that loan. Remember, you can't go out and lien the property because the mortgage already has that first lien. So a lot of times if you rehab it, you're going to have to come out of money out of pocket for, with your own money or partner with somebody that's okay with not putting a lien on the property or something. You know what I'm saying? Like you could say, okay, let's partner. Let's just form a company and let's go rehab it and then we can split the profit in the middle. Okay. So those are the two strategies. And so you can rehab it, you can, or you can rent it. And then on the back end, you can either, if it's a rental property, you can refi it out, right? And get it in, and get and keep that property in your name, or you can sell it, put it on the MLS or sell it or whatever you want to do later. Or you could um, rehab it and sell it, rehab it and rent it or rehab it and sell it. Those are kind of your extra strategies for that. Okay, and you and the good thing is that you you also bring the credit of the buyer current, right? So like let's just say they had like a 600 credit score, and then over the course of the year, like you bring it up because you've been paying on time and everything, right? So now they've got a 680 credit score because of you, right? And that's kind of how that works. Okay, so questions on that? I know there's got to be lots of questions on that too. Oh my gosh. If you have any questions, put it in the Q&A. If you put it in the chat, it's not going to get answered, okay? Okay, let me go through. How do you arrange the numbers to be certain you have enough funds to cover existing seller mortgage and make a profit? What do you mean by this? How do you arrange the numbers? So are you talking about for a lease option? Put down if you're talking about lease option or subject to or owner financing. If you put it in the questions, just put that in. How do you arrange the numbers to be certain you have enough funds to cover the existing seller's mortgage and make a profit? I'm not sure if you talk about owner, seller, uh, lease option or owner or, or subject to. So go tell me which one you're talking about that. Would sandwich lease options be a su good suggestion for wholesalers? I mean, you see all the time, uh, you see all the time wholesalers that are wholesaling lease options. There are, so there's, there's buyers that are looking, and especially nowadays, especially nowadays, when you build your buyers list up, you want to ask them, like, would you be interested in a lease option or like a subject to our wholesale bill, right? Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of investors, especially now that we'd be open to this, right? Or when you blast it out, you know, blast it in your email list, whatever you do, just put like in the subject to the subject line, like lease option you know, lease option and a deal available or something like this. And then makes you explain it in your, in your blast. Um, but yes, um, you can wholesale a lease option. You can wholesale owner financed houses. You can wholesale um, subject to as well, as well. Which super group would you recommend to a new investor? Oh, okay. Like totally random question. Okay. So super groups, I would highly recommend wholesaling 101, rehabbing 101 and um, creative deal structuring. Now, um, it, and actually it really depends. I see Michael's on here. Michael runs the, uh, the, the mobile home one. He's having a virtual meeting 
next Monday. So if you're interested in mobile homes, make sure you go to the South Renteria page and get the link and jump on for that. Number two is um, creative deal structuring is a virtual meeting now. Okay, so uh, just go, maybe go to South Lanteria and click on the virtual meeting. And they're virtual now, so really anybody in the United States can watch these suckers. It's not like it's only just South Lanteria people, right? And um, what else? Uh, and then also Mike's Wholesaling 101 is virtual. Okay, right, so right now the super groups that we have that are virtual. Wholesaling 101, Creative Deal Structuring, um, vacation airbnb haves and wants and the mobile home madness okay those are the five ones that we have virtual right now so if you're interested just join all of them and just check them all out right they're all virtual anyways you can go to any of them okay so i assume that if the equity falls below a hundred thousand at the end of the lease you just walk away yeah you could just do that like if it just and if it fall if it goes like if something happens and the house is just like goes to shit or whatever then just be like all right i don't want to buy it it is an option right it's an op that's a good thing about an option an option is an option options like ah oh, maybe i will maybe i won't right you know and so it gives you an option to buy it but it gives you the first right it gives you the first right so if they can like somebody else comes and says i want to buy it like they can't buy it unless you get a, like you give them approval first. Let's just say that a year and somebody comes and offers like the seller to sell, you can be like, all right, well maybe give me $5,000 and I'll drop my option from you or something like this. Yeah. But it's just an option essentially. Okay, in the lease option, who pays for small repairs like plumbing? It's renter, it's rental, it's a rental, right? Now you and this, the seller may be like, look, I, I you know, like, because like, for instance, in my rental agreements, like I have my rental agreement that like little tiny minor, like things that need to be repaired, I do not repair them. Essentially, my agreement says anything that's $100 or less, I don't, I don't pay for at all. All right, so maybe the seller does something like this. Now, if the HVAC goes out or something, the seller is responsible for this because it's a lease option, right? But um, but other than that, like, and I put that into my rent, and that's a very good tip for anybody. Put it in, like, $100 or less, like, I don't even want you to, to talk to me. Like, you need to, like, no light bulbs need to be switched out or anything like that. Like, that's just not my thing, okay? And actually, my tenants, like, they don't even bother me at all, honestly, because I put that in, and I think maybe, like, scares them a little bit. Okay do I need to put the contract with the seller that I'll be leasing it to another? Yes. There's two different there's. So if you do a sandwich lease option, there's going to be four different contracts, right? I mean, you at least with an option to the, to the seller, and then you at least to lease in an option to the buyer, right? So there's four, you're, you're, you're in four contracts. The seller has the two contracts and the new buyer has two contracts. Make sense. Okay. Do you need to pay the back payments for the mortgage payments? Yes. If you're talking about subject to, you got to bring those current. Yes. That's what a subject to is, is you are bringing everything current. So you have to come out of money. You have to come out of pocket. Now you can wholesale a subject to. So let's just say you don't, let's just say it's behind like $10,000 or something. You're like, I don't have 10,000. What should I do? I have 10,000. You get wholesale that sucker. And guess what? The down payment could be $15,000. Right, so you have to pay the ten thousand dollars goes to paying off the mortgage, and then you get the five thousand dollars. Right, that's your like cut or whatever, and that's how you wholesale it. Okay, so the whole when you see like when you see subject twos that are being wholesaled, essentially that's what they're doing is making money in that, in that in that down payment for the the deal. Does that make sense? Let me know. Can subject to properties be used to build a rental portfolio? Absolutely. It's one of the best ways. Now, you just have to be, like I said, you don't want to be renting for more than a couple of years. So essentially your strategy should be like um, a wholesale, a couple of deals, and then, oh, guess what? Like I got one, it's a subject to, and that one's going to go in my portfolio. Now I'm going to go out and look for some more deals and wholesale them. Oh, there's another subject to, and I'll just put that one in my portfolio. And each of those, I say, I'm going to hold on to those for maybe two years or three years each. And then after three years, I'm going to refi those out, right? And then you could just slowly like wholesale, subject to wholesale. So you could build your portfolio very, um, very well that way. All right, but just keep your mortgage payments on time, number one, and number two, don't have long, you can't hold them for a long time. Some people out there hold them for a long time. So my personal opinion is like, 
just refi it out. Make sure that in a couple of years you can refi that sucker out, okay? I have never done a subject to wrap. I have never done a subject to wrap. So I'm not 100% sure, like, I guess with the subject to wrap, it's just too complicated for me, honestly. That's more like an advanced level. And that basically means like, you're going to subject to that property and, and actually, and they have a loan on that property and you're gonna subject to it and then you're gonna re resell it or re uh, lease it out or re-own or finance it out. And essentially for me, there's a couple of people, if you're interested in wraps, there's a couple of people that teach wraps. Um, and it's just very advanced level. I mean, it's just very advanced level. Is uh, Dyke Spotiford, which I don't sure if he, if he teach him, but Pete Fortunato, Dyke Spotiford, kind of these kind of, if you know who they are, that's the group that you want to start following if you're interested in wraps. And, and wraps are not, it's not a bad thing. It's just that it's very complicated, right? And so I feel like my personal opinion, like you know, it's just like the easier it is, the more I'm going to do it, right? Because like, you know, the longer you invest, the more you just want to like make it easy. But yeah, so if you're interested, focus on those two people, I would say. Your, you answered it. Okay, awesome. Uh, if you do a subject two, can't the mortgage company recall the mortgage? Yes, yes. It's called a do on sale clause. Yes. Everybody has to be aware on this. That's why I'm saying that you don't want to have it for a long period of time, all right? And you don't want to be late on your mortgage. That's called due on sale, okay? So you just want, and you will, when you talk to the mortgage company, you will let them know like, oh, hey, like my name is like, you know, Stacey Rossetti and I'm going to start making these payments. Like John Smith can, is, you know, is no longer making it. You're going to get a check for me. Can you please mark that in? And just let them know. Now you don't go in and say, hey, I'm assuming the loan. Uh, yeah, I'm like totally going to take over in this. Like you don't say it that way. You just say like John Smith can no longer make the payments. So I'm going to be making the payments. So you might see some checks coming from Stacey Rossetti or whatever, or Diamond in the Rough or whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? Most of the lenders, I would say, are not going to even care about this. Just as long as the mortgage is being paid, you should be fine. Is the lender notified when the name on the deed changes? And if so, what will they do? Yes. That's what I'm saying is you've got to let them know, like, I'm going to be making the payments. I am getting the deed now. I'm the one making the payments. And you will have to notify the bank, all right? You will have to let them know, all right? So basically what happens is the seller is going to sign a piece of paper that says, um, like, it's going to allow you to be able to get into their account. So you're going to be able to get in and talk to the people and stuff. And that's when you say, like, they're not, they can't make the payments anymore. I'm going to start making the payments, all right? And that's when you tell them. So yes, you have to notify them. If you don't have the money to bring current, what sources of funding could we access short term, especially if we're renovating funds? So basically, like these types of deals, you've got to be able to come up with funds to uh, bring it current, right? So like I said, if you can't come up with the money, now if you can come up with a couple thousand dollars, most people are buying behind a couple thousand dollars, but every once in a while you'll get one that's behind like 10 or 15 or 20 grand, right? And so then if you can't come up with that money, then essentially just wholesale it out. That's what you can do. And the, there's plenty of people out there that will, that'll, that'll do that deal for you, okay? What is the risk in subject two? The do on sale clause is the risk in subject two, all right? Do sellers have always, have always to back out of the deal? No, this, no, because you're getting the deed. You're going to buy the property. You're not buying it. You're going to get the deed at closing. So you are going to own the property. You are going to own the property and the seller is going to leave the mortgage in place for you over the course of X amount of time for you to make the payments and get their credit back in order. That's what it is. Let me know if that makes sense. Is it better to focus on nicer homes if you don't have capital for the rehab? Yeah, this is perfect for a pretty house. This is ex if you go if you want to go learn about pretty houses, what I'm teaching you is exactly what you do for pretty houses. In fact, I'm going to go over an example of a, of a nice house that I made almost 80 grand on this year. Not this year, sorry, last year. Okay, so you'll have that in just a second. And let's see, if you decide on rent, you guys are asking some good questions. This is awesome. All right, if you decide to rent, who do you re refinance your name? Who do you refinance into your name? 
for which one? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Is that lease option or subject to? Okay, let me know. If it's subject to, you are getting the deed. The deed is coming to you. You are going to own the property. All right? You leave the mortgage, take the house. Leave the mortgage, take the house. Leave the mortgage, take the house. What happens is if the person holding the mortgage dies while loan is uh, not paying, paid in full and you hold the property, ha am I now going to be responsible? Yes. Yes, you're going to be responsible. So I would refi that sucker out is what I would do. Always have exit strategy, right? Just in case you need to have an exit strategy. All right, so don't just go in and be like, awesome, now I just got this house for a couple of years and whatever happens just happens. No, it's like you need to plan A, B, and C in the back of your mind just in case, right? Okay, that's what you need, all right? The, the best investors are the most resourceful investors. Hands down, I'm telling you, the best investors are the most resourceful investors. And if you can if you can pull money out of your ass or close the deal, then you are going to be just fine, right? I'm telling you. So you got to be, this is creative deal structuring. There's a box and you got to be out here thinking all the time, especially in the downturn. All right, the, the more creative you are, the more resourceful you are over the next couple of months, the better you're gonna be in the next couple of years, right? Because it's now is the time to think outside the box. All right. How and when does the seller get paid and is subject to when you sell the house? Well, I mean, actually, no, you don't. But the seller does, I'm, excuse me, you're wrong. The seller, the, you get paid when you sell the house. The buy, like the seller is just handing the house over to you. They don't need, they don't get paid. I mean, you know, like you could negotiate the deal. Like, I mean, essentially what could happen is they'd be like, look, I need like, I know I owe like $7,000 in tax taxes. I totally get that. That's a lot of money, but I also need some money to move. I need a couple thousand dollars. So in order for you to take my house, I'm going to require $3,000 for you to move. And they could say that, right? Like, and so that means you have to come up with $10,000 and not just $7,000. It's negotiable. Or what you could say is like, you know what? Like, this is really, honestly, this house is like, it's not really worth that much money. Like it's worth, you say, you say it's worth a hundred thousand and I ran comps. That's like, it's worth maybe a hundred thousand. That's it. Like, this is not a good deal. And I don't know if I'm going to be making, you know, that much money on this house in the next couple of years, like maybe in five years in the upturn, I can sell it and make money, but it's going to be tight over these next couple of years. So I don't really know if I'm going to be able to do this. So if you want me to take this house, you're going to have to pay me $5,000 because I need to have money to fix up this mess, clean everything up and get it in order so I can rent this out. So if you want me to take the house, it's gonna cost you $5,000. What do you think? Think somebody will do that? Give it a try and see, all right? So maybe get them to pay you some money, right? You don't have to come out of pocket, they can come out of pocket. If they're desperate enough, they'll come out of pocket. Would you re-repeat what you said about rehabbing subject two? You can rehab subject two. So essentially you don't, you get the deed. So that means that you get the house, right? You have to come out of pocket, whatever they're behind or whatever. Maybe they're not behind. Maybe they're just like, screw this house. I'm tired of paying this mortgage. I'm out, right? And so then you just, you get the house, you get the deed. And then guess what? You, all you have to do is come up with the money to rehab the house. That's it. So you have to come out of pocket or you have to partner with somebody and then somebody has money because you can't put the, there's already a lien on the property. Remember, there's a mortgage lien, right? The first lien is the bank of, of whatever bank, you know, whatever they're called, uh, Wells Fargo or whatever, right? So like you can't get like another loan and get a lien, a first lien, because lenders are going to be like, I want first lien, right? There's nobody that's going to be like, I want a second lien or whatever, rarely, okay? So especially now in the downturn, like there's not going to be a lot of lenders that are doing seconds, all right, if they're smart, okay? And um, so, so what's going to happen is you're going to have to find somebody with money and then partner with them. Be like, yo, what's up? Got me a house here. I didn't have to pay any money for it, but I do need 25, 30, 40 grand for this rehab. So why don't we partner? You bring that money, we'll form a company, form an LLC, and then you can rehab and then we'll just split the profit at the end. What do you think? 
doable? Can you do it, Chris? Okay. Uh, what is the deal on insurance? Get your own insurance, no matter what, on everything, every time, get your own insurance. Do not rely on anybody else's insurance. Get your own insurance. Get your own insurance. Get your own insurance. Liability insurance, uh, any type of insurance that you can get, I would just get it, right? Be safe with the insurance. It's a scam. I know it's a scam, right? So factor in a little bit of money for some insurance, but you got to do it. Did I answer your question? Let me know. So what happens if you get to a point where you can no longer make the mortgage payments on the seller's behalf? Sell that sucker. Sell it. Be like, shit, I can't make payments anymore. I got to get rid of this thing. Who wants a house? And then just sell it. If you have to, sell it for exactly what it's worth and be done with it or make some money on it if you can make some money on it. All right? You can't make the mortgage payments and get rid of the house. Exit strategy. And that would be one of your exit strategies. Just sell it. Subject to. No idea, Jennifer. How do you find a seller who wants to do a subject to deal? Oh, what kind of lists want to do subject to deals? Foreclosure, pre-foreclosure, 30, 60, 90, distressed properties. Uh, who else, uh, Deanna? Give me some names, all right? Um, I mean, any type, it's any type of deal, honestly, but mostly those, okay, all right? Any, you could just randomly just say like, hey, can I just take over your payments? And it could be like, you know, I don't know, probate deal or something, you know? So you can just, you can take over anybody's payments on any type of deal, honestly. Subject to can be any type of deal, but it's more prevalent in those. Do you expect there to be people wanting to do subject to deals because of the virus situation? Yes, that is the whole point of this presentation is because you will be hearing over the course of the next 90 days exactly what I'm telling you. And actually even more, you know, over the next couple of years, you're going to be so tired of subject to. You're going to be so tired of it. You're going to be so tired of notes, subject to. Lease options, sandwich lease options, owner financing, wraps. You're going to just be tired of it because everybody can be doing it, right? It's like wholesaling rehabbing on an upturn, but now you're going in a downturn. Is there any kind of, is there any risk to doing a subject to in your LLC name? No, do it in your LLC name. Definitely protect yourself. Would the bank have any issues with that? No, they won't. Like just make the payments, right? So have like, basically have like, you know, I would have like Diamond in the Rough as my company and then under, underneath I would have Stacy Rossetti, right? Just say, go, Stacy Rossetti is going to be paying it and then it just comes out of your bank account, okay? I just sold the subject to after two years and made $55,000. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you. All right, so Deanna, has already done a subject to, and she made 55 grand off of it. And she did it for two years, which, which is the perfect amount of time. I'm telling you, a couple of years is the perfect amount of time. Three or less years, depending on your exit strategy. Can subject to be deal, deals be found on the MLS? Well, you really need to be talking to the seller directly on these. And you can't talk to the seller directly if it's on the MLS, okay? So, um, now maybe expired listings, go to expired listings and be like, yo, what's going on? Why didn't anybody buy your house? I'm here, Stacy Rosetta here to save the day. And then go on to your subject two stuff, okay? So expired listings, you can talk to the seller, but you gotta talk to the seller directly on this stuff, okay? Okay, all right. Oh, guys, I need a, like a beer right now. What's going on? So many questions. Okay. Owner financing, owner financing. Okay, so this is my favorite. I love owner financing. Yes, I own or finance everything. You, you name it, I'll own or finance it. When a property buyer finances the direct, the purchase directly through the person or entity selling it, the prospect buyer cannot obtain funding through a conventional mortgage lender. All right. The buyer is willing to pay the prevailing market interest rates. 
Seller may require a higher down payment than a mortgage lender. The deed is usually not transferred to the buyer until all of the payments have been made. You can do creative financing, you do seller financing. All right, let me give you an example. Actually, this is one of my houses. Is it an ugly house or a pretty house? What do y'all think? It's a pretty house! Look at this beautiful, pretty house that I got. I acquired this property. I got this off of a free and clear list, okay? So owner financing, you wanna be focusing on free and clear properties, right? Mostly free and clear, unless you wanna learn how to do wraps. Wraps is different, right? But like owner financing, I would honestly just focus on free and clear, inherited properties, maybe some probate. Um, those are the kind of lists. Now remember, these are unmotivated sellers. Remember, subject to motivated, right? Pre-foreclosure, foreclosure, motivated. Free and clear, not so motivated, right? So you gotta be like, yo, give me a hug. Oh, actually, you can't do hugs right now. So you gotta do some fist bumps or whatever, some elbow bumps with your seller, okay? And um, so I acquired this property I, from a free and clear list. And the, uh, the couple that owned this property lived in a house like maybe 15 minutes away. And this was their second property and it was free and clear. So I offered, I asked them, I said, well, how much do you owe on the mortgage? I mean, I'm sorry, how much, you, how much would you like to sell this for? And they said $125,000. And I said, okay, this, this, I mean, that's probably about what it was worth, right? Like when I was there, when I was going to buy it, okay? And so I said, okay, well, this is, this is what I would like to offer you guys. I said, honestly, I can't, I gave them a couple different offers. I said, honestly, I can't pay $125 because it's not quite there yet with the $125. $25,000, but um, I can give you, I can pay you like, I'll pay you like $85,000 cash, you know, or I'll pay you $125,000. But if I pay you $125,000, this is the terms that I want. Now I said, I will do a five-year balloon at $650 a month. I didn't say the interest rate, but if you calculate it up, that's the interest rate. Uh, that's a 0% interest on five years, okay? So essentially, I always lead with like just the, the length of the loan. I said, what if I just buy this from you? What if I do a mortgage of $650 a month and I, I buy this in five years? Would you be open to doing something like that? And I, and I think probably over the course of like the, the month that we talked to each other, we probably went back and forth on, you know, negotiated a couple of things. The things that you're going to negotiate are your interest rate. You're always going to start out with zero five-year balloon, any type of balloon, when are you going to, is it two, three, four, five, I mean, 10 years, some of the stuff that I own or finance is 10, 12 years, own or financing, when the seller is the bank, all they care about is the monthly payment, all they care about is the monthly payment, okay, so, that's what you lead with is the monthly payment. So what if I just pay you $650 for five years and at the end of five years, I buy the place. Would you be interested in that? And they were like, yeah, we could do that. So essentially I had to go into this property and it needed like a little bit of work. The person that lived, before, lived there before, cause they were renting it out. The person that lived there before was like, you know, like, so I just had to clean it up and like paint and, it was wood floors. So we refinished them again and just kind of like fixed the place up. Not nice. This is not like a, this is a $125,000 house. So it's not like, you know, super nice, like for Micah countertops and things like this, but it was still like a nice home. And um, so then I went out. So I, uh, so we actually, so what happened is I signed a contract with the attorney. The attorney did everything, right? So you do this with the attorney. And I signed a contract with them. They did the note. So we did a note. The attorney did the note. I signed the note with the terms in it. And then I got the deed to the property, right? Sorry, that's not right. In five years, I got the deed to the property and I sold it. That's not true. So um, what happened, let me, let, me, let me back up. So I signed the note and we had an, a deal where in five years I'd get the I'd get the deed. All right, that's basically how it worked. Is it? Yeah. So essentially, what happened was I rented the place out for a thousand dollars and rented it. Right. So I made like you know four hundred dollars a month or something like this. 
and uh, I rented it for five, for almost five years, for like four and a half years. And um, and if you calculate that down, right? So one hundred and twenty-five thousand, and I paid six hundred fifty dollars a month for five years. The mortgage came to eighty thousand dollars. Right. So in fact, in year five, I owed eighty thousand dollars. Right. And so what happened was I just had the the person that lived there that rented it out. I said, okay, well, like I'm, I need to sell the place now. So essentially do you want to buy it now or do you want to move out and they said we just want to move out and i said okay so i i basically cleaned the property up again i probably spent another like couple thousand dollars cleaning it up and it needed another paint job inside but it wasn't really too bad right so i probably totally spent like in the five years maybe like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to clean it up okay and then um i listed the property right and I listed it for a hundred and like I think either fifty nine thousand or no I listed it for one hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars, right? And uh, and I got like in one day I got like twenty showings and like five offers, and um, <clears throat> and the and uh, we and they were all kind of low like a little bit lower so they, I ended up going with one hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars was a conventional loan, and. Um, we sold the property and I made like, so essentially you see, like I only owed $80,000 to the mortgage, to the, to the, to the people, the couple that owned it. And so they got their $80,000 and then I got the rest. I got like, I got like $75,000. And so essentially like over the course of five years, I not only made like $400 a month on that property, Right. And really there was not a lot that needed to get done. I had to put a new H one of the years I had to put a new HVAC system. in, so that cost me like maybe an AC system that cost maybe like $2,500. But um, the property looked almost exactly like this when we bought the place. And uh, so I really didn't put a lot of money over the course of the five years. I didn't pay interest on the property over five years. And then I sold the property on top of that for like 160 grand. And I made like, you know, 75 grand on it. So, I mean, if you calculate that up, if you really run the numbers on that, I mean, your IR, your ROI over the course of five years is just astronomical, right? It's just ridiculous how high it is, like 50, 60%. All right. So, <clears throat> So that's why I love owner financing. So does anybody have any questions on that? I'm sure y'all are gonna go nuts on that too. So owner financing, so essentially you have the seller, owner finance it to you, and then you can rent it out at, for a certain period of time and then on the back end sell it. But you get the deed, that's the issue, that when you close the property, you get the deed, okay? So the, the property is actually yours. Now, but the but the but the own but the sellers the people that are the are the, the, the bank they became the the lien on the property so they were literally like a wells fargo or something is what they are that's what owner financing is so let me know if you have any questions on that now opposite of that is that so for instance like on land like in land we actually own we actually owner finance land to other people so we're the bank we're the bank as well too okay so you can do this yourself and you can be the bank. You can sell or finance your, you know, yourself. And, um, and then, and especially if it's not like it, like land is not like huge, big amounts of money. You know, so you can find a piece of property for $5,000 and then owner finance it for $10,000 over the course of, you know, three years or something like this, you know, and then you can be the bank. And um, so, you like that's the that's the whole point is you can be in the bank or somebody can be the bank for you so for instance like on my storage facilities i have the owners the previous owners being the bank for me i'm now the owner because i get the deed right and i own the property i'm buying it from them and then they're the bank all right so i'm buying the property from them but they're the bank so they get a note is what it is does that make sense to y'all please let me know any questions on um any questions on owner financing? Owner financing to me is one of the best ways to make money. I'm telling you because if you calculate how uh, like how much money you can make on a monthly rate, 
and then like how much you can sell it on the back end, your, IR, your ROI is just so high, right? So owner financing to me is one of the best ways to make money. And you can definitely find property. This property I found literally in the downturn, like coming out of the downturn, right? So you can find these properties all the time. And you can do this type of instructor. You can do this anytime. But Okay, so let me know. Owner financing. Did I clear that up for owner financing? Oh, my goodness. Sounds like a lease option. The owner financing are very similar. Yes, except for owner financing, you get the deed, right? Lease option, you don't get the deed for a couple of years, but owner financing, you actually get the deed, okay? What, did the seller know you'd be renting it out? Yes, they know, yes, they knew. I'm always telling, I'm very open with what I'm doing. I'm telling them exactly what I do, all my transactions. I'm not hiding anything, right? And they only live like 15 minutes away, so like every once in a while, they're like, yeah, we drove by our house, looking good. And then they're like, oh, thanks for taking it out because I like never went there. And that's the one thing, the good thing about owner financing is that when they, the, the people, um, well, and actually the people that moved into it, like they wanted to owner finance it. They want, I was trying to get them to buy it. And so, and actually we set up a deal where they could, a lease option where they could buy it. I did a lease, actually that's what I did is I did a lease option. And I said, okay, like live here. And then, and like four years, you could four, four and a half years, you can buy. And I said, yeah, I said, that's definitely enough time for you to get your credit up and stuff. Right. And in the end, they just couldn't get their credit up. I mean, this is like, it's one of these videos, like typical American where they just live like paycheck to paycheck. They didn't save any money over the course of like four or five years. And so I said, okay, time to get out. Cause I got to sell it, you know, but I own or I, I lease optioned the house to them while it was being owner financed to me pretty good huh all right and I got a down payment too I got like a five thousand dollar down payment so I got that money I was like yeah I got some five thousand dollars I didn't have to give that money back and then I own her fine I mean I at least option to them and then on the end of, I sold it and I made another seventy five thousand dollars I mean that's just awesome okay uh what is it is it assignable? It's assignable, correct? This is this is like as as long as the terms are in the purchase and sell agreement. Like, are you talking about you want to wholesale like a subject to? You can wholesale owner financing exactly subject to. You can wholesale any lease option. You can wholesale them all, <clears throat> just as long as you use an assignable contract. It must be assignable, okay? If you are a member of the South Lanaria and you are an action taker, you have a contract in the forms directory, okay? That's where you can get an assignable contract. You can get lease, you can get options. You can get rental agreements all in the forms directory as a member of the South Lanaria action taker. So the mortgage is still in the same as seller's name. When you don't tell me which one of these things that you're working on, like I have no idea now. You have three structure deals now. So like, I don't know which one you're talking about, Chris. So put down, I'm talking about in a lease option, Stacy. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. And own, oh, see, Evelyn did it. Evelyn did it. Thank you, Evelyn. And owner financing, is it okay to list the house without having the deed? When you don't list it until you close on the property. All right. So you are actually going to buy the property from them. Right. And then you could like, yeah, I listed it. It was my property. After I bought it, it was mine. Now you can't go and list a leased option because really that's not your house. You can't list it on the MLS. But the owner financing, I bought the house and then I lease option to that. Does that make sense? Do you still have to use a realtor or broker to owner finance deals? No. No. This is a seller to seller seller to seller love realtors love realtors but they're not going to understand this type of stuff unless you're an investor realtor unless you're a savvy investor realtor you don't want to get people and get realtors involved love them but like let's just keep those that's the whole point of being an investor just go directly to the seller and be like yo what's up let's do a deal let's not get anybody involved here right like it's just me and you it's me and you right here okay uh, how much money do you typically put down on an owner finance deal? Nothing. Hopefully start out with nothing. 
All right, so once you join my mastermind, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of y'all that are interested in this, but essentially in my mastermind, this is where I go deep into this, deep. Like you're going to be a, a creative deal structuring uh, master. I don't know what you're going to be. It's like, you're just going to be like, wah, 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 wah. All right, so, but essentially what happens is that in owner financing deals, you can do a hundred different types of structures. You could do none. You could do interest. You could do no interest. You could do 10 years, five years, seven years, eight years. You could do, and you could do all, you could do like a million different ways. That's the beauty of a structure, of a creative deal structure. Okay. You can also add that to your rental portfolio. Yes. Yes. Now you're getting it, Chris. If the seller is thinking of listing the property, what are you ta what are the talking points to convince them to finance the property for me? Like if they're thinking about listing it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially you're just going to be like you're going to just talk to them and like like you need to build rapport. Like I said, these people are unmotivated sellers that are just like, yeah, I could just list it or whatever. And I'm like, so what you want to say is like, yeah, I want to close like next week. Like I, I can close on this right now list it man you know that covid really screwed the economy up didn't it like we don't quite know where the real estate market is going right now right you know like the world economy is crashing and things are not going well in the real estate market so you can wait it out if you'd like to do that or we could close in, the, in like the next three weeks because I'm ready to close. I can close this now. And especially if it's an owner phone financing deal, you put no money down, 0% interest and start just paying like on a monthly payment. You can come up with a thousand dollars, right? You can just close like, and then they, all you have to do is run title and close a deal. You know what I'm saying? There's no like lender involved. You know what I'm saying? That's the beauty. There's no lender involved, right? Except for the seller's the lender. But I'm talking about like, you know, like Wells Fargo or whatever, because they just get in like screw everything up anyways, right? All right. Does an investor-friendly attorney have all the necessary? Yes. That's why I said you got to just have an attorney that could be like, not just like, I'll call Josh up and I'll be like, yo, Josh, I got a good one for you time to close. You ready? And then I'll be like, and then what I do is I position it. So it's like, I want to put you in touch with my attorney because my attorney really kind of knows more about how to close this deal than I do. Like, look, like I'd rather like, let's just talk to my attorney. We can do like a, a conference call together. That way you meet them. I introduce you. And then like, they can really manage all the documents. It's better if the attorney manages all the documents, right? Don't you think? Owner, with owner financing, no, you are buying the house. You get to buy the house yourself for zero down or little money down. When they are talking about little money down, this is the kind of stuff that they're talking about, right? And you get the deed. Evelyn, owner financing, continuing from the previous question, did you get the deed after you listed and sold it, thus paying the buyer off? Yes, exactly. So the owner is the you the owner is selling you the property, but the owner is becoming the bank, so has the lien on the property. The owner is selling you the property, you get the deed and the first lien, they get the first lien on the property. They are the bank. They are just like a Wells Fargo. So you buy the property from them and then they get a lien on the property. So you get a deed and a note. How do you search for free and clear properties? Talk to uh, either Deanna, I'm not sure if Deanna does free and clear, but or Karen Anderson is our list broker for the South Atlanta area. She can definitely do free and clear for you. Um, all right, so you can go into our vendor directory on the South Atlanta area and then search Karen Anderson and she can, um, she can, or you can actually go like, if you're a member of the South Atlanta area, you can even watch her webinars because she's done a couple webinars as well, so. I was our, our, like, I, I just, I just go to Deanna and Karen is what I do. If there's anybody else, put it in the chat. All right. If you want to suggest somebody, but Deanna and Karen is what I do. Okay, cool. Got it. Thank you very much. Okay. Awesome. Okay, cool. All right. So now we've been through this thread. You guys have just, you guys have just, oh my gosh, I need a glass of wine now. I'm going to go home and have a glass of wine. I thought it was going to work late, but I don't think I can do it anymore. My brain is just fried. 
All right, thank you guys. Top strategies for su success, right? Systems delegating, delegating credibility. These are only, these are, these are what's gonna help you to become successful over the next couple of months. And this is exactly what I teach, right? This is exactly what I teach, right? So this is why I wanted to point out to please, please, please check out my mentoring program. I'm telling you that you, if you join the mentoring program, I can make you not only understand this, but essentially your whole business will be uh, ran on these types of concepts. I mean, I will make you into a lean, mean, automatic machine, right? That's what I do with my students, okay? So that, and I'm here to, all these questions, what's gonna happen is they're gonna go out your brain in the next 30 minutes, right? And so like, I'm the type of person, like I'm the coach where you're like, oh, Stacy, crap, I don't know. I, I got the free and clear list and I offered, I offered, I offered owner financing and now like, I don't know what to do, right? And I'll be like, yo, I'm here, man. I'm here to help you, okay? So that is what a coach is for, is to help you and guide you and get you, uh, get you going, all right? So these are the things that I teach. This is what I'm teaching right now, literally in the mastermind. All right, so the beginner's mastermind is the five offer system. We're focusing over the next couple of weeks on several things. Number one is how to wholesale, all right, and how to do creative deal structuring and how to find private money. For me, these are the three most important things that you should be focusing, I'm sorry, four. And then marketing strategies, getting your marketing strategies. So marketing strategies, wholesaling, five offer system, and private money. For me, these are the, the four most important things that you should be focusing on over the next month or so. And this is what we're focusing on in our mastermind, okay? How to do these types of deals. So that you can be ready, you can be armed and ready. When you do get that, that marketing set up, it's like, I know I feel comfortable giving these offers and making these types of uh, deals. So please go to stacyrosetti.com slash beginners dash mastermind. That is where you'll find out all about my mastermind. We have group coaching, virtual group coaching. Okay. So you get like, you get to meet with me every other Wednesday, right? For two hours, two to two and a half hours. I sit and talk to my students and we go over every single time we go over new topics. I have speakers coming in, but mostly I teach. I do a lot of teaching and everybody's at different levels within the group, but it is the power of group coaching is that it's not only just me. You've got like a whole group of people that are leaning on each other, helping each other grow. I really want to grow this group. I really feel like now is the time for people to be, you know, to be learning about investing in real estate and arming yourself and educating yourself and getting a mentor and a coach, right? Um, so, and then on top of that, once everything subsides over, we're going to have two face-to-face uh, -face group masterminds where we get together and we'll actually be together for two days and then really just kind of like mastermind, I'll teach, and then we'll go around the room and everybody try to really get a plan set up for everybody. Whatever you're at, wherever you're located, these are my ch challenges, these are my wins, how can Stacy help me to move forward, right? So that's that. And then, um, and then we also offer accountability to see what happens is after this, everybody's on this call listening, which is great, right? But then what happens later, right? So the group coaching in the mastermind essentially is all about accountability. So we have accountability software where you get in and you put all the goals in that you want. And then what happens is the software makes you accountable. Right. So it says you put your you put your goal like I want to get one deal within the next 30 days. OK, well, now what do you got to do for that? Like you can't just say I'm going to have a deal in the next 30 days. OK, well, what is the marketing strategy you're going to be setting up? Right. How much are you going to do? How much are you, money are you going to spend every single month? You know, what are you going to be doing to acquire these goals? And then you create all these metrics and stuff. And that's what the accountability software is for. And it's actually very it's very good software. I use it for all of my goals as well, too just reminds me of like what I need to do. And then it holds the whole group accountable, right? So everybody, get, I'll put metrics in, like your goal today is your goal, your homework for this week is to like set up one marketing strategy. And then, and then at the end of the week, I'll ask, did you set your strategy up? And then what will happen is if you put yes, you go on the green. If you put no, you go on the red. And then everybody sees a green or a red and they're like, oh my gosh, shit, like I'm going in the red. I need to hurry up and catch up with everybody else, right? And kind of gets you like even more motivated, right? So you can stay with the group 
And let's see what else. And then also every Friday, I do office hours for my students. All right, so it's all day coaching calls. So you set an appointment, have your thing, have your questions ready, right? And that's not just lollygagging on the phone, but it's like, have your questions ready and then I answer them. Bam, 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 bam. I tell you what you need to do, get you motivated for that next week and you move on. That's available every Friday for any one of my students, okay? And then you get like every every system, template, checklist, anything that you need, I got it all, I promise. I got it all, right? Because I've done every type of transaction. And then you just have whatever one that you need, I'll put it right into the Coach Accountable software and you can find that file right there and you can download it. So if you need contracts or spec sheets, scope of works, and this is like beginner mastermind, essentially what I mean is that um, you like, as of, uh, you know, in order for you to get started, there's, there are foundations that have to be done. You have to work on all these different types of things in order for your, your company to become, you know, uh, you know, this like, um, systematized and automatic machine that you want it to become. So essentially everybody has to learn the same things, right? Everybody has to learn the same thing. So yeah, somebody may be interested in rentals or rehabbing or wholesaling, whatever you're interested in. Still, the company is going to be the same, right? The company is going to be same, right? You set your business up the same way so that you can get those leads in. And then you have a choice of whether or not you want to wholesale it or rehab it or buy it as a rental or whatever you want to do. Okay. So what are your goals for the next 90 days? That's my personal opinion. Um, uh, I've been working on a couple of things over the last couple of months that are gonna, my goal is to get those done this month, right? And so I'm asking you, what are your goals, all right? So if you need some help with trying to figure out where to turn, what to do, where should I be going, then just set up a, an implementation strategy session with me. I have free sessions. And whenever my calendar is available, you can go in and book a time, they're 30 minutes, and let me just kind of help you, like, you know, with your next goals, I'll tell you, like, you need to do this, this, and this. I had four, I had four calls today, but I sat with 30 minutes for each one, and I said, do this, 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 and this, all right? And I can, and I can give you more information about the mastermind if you want it or not, it's, you know, that's your choice, but essentially, if you need help, set that strategy session up so I can help you to move into the next direction, because I really want everybody to succeed over the next couple of months, and I want that fear to go away, right, that everybody has this back in the mind, this fear, you know, and I want to help everybody with that. That's it. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Any other questions? Anything else? Anything? Anything? Okay, we got a couple more questions. Okay, let's see. I'll answer a couple more questions. Let's see. I'm going to leave that on that page so y'all can see the, the website. Somebody was asking that. Let me see. Okay, uh, where did I go? Uh, 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 uh. How much money do you typically put down for owner finance? We already did that one, right? Yes, you can answer your reservoir. Hang on, I think I passed these. Yes, okay, got it, okay. How do you, uh, how do you access expired listings if you're not an agent? Ask an agent for the list. That's the only way, you have to be, you have to have access to the MLS, okay? Um, do you teach creative deal structuring for buying mobile homes or storages? I, yes, I do. I do storage facilities. Well, I mean, uh, I have a storage facility mastermind as well, too. So if you're interested in the storage facility one, just go to stacyrosetti.com and click on the storage facility one. And I'm telling you, if, if you're interested in wholesaling, rehabbing, rental properties, creative deal structuring, you know, residential redevelopment, this kind of stuff, that is like your beginner's mastermind. But if you're interested in storage that's like a whole nother mastermind so you can check out both if you're interested in either one but yes I do creative deal structuring as I said you can use creative deal structuring for anything so all my students learn how to do exactly what I just talked today do you have a system to generate offers instead of manually making them out I wish I totally wish I wish can you somebody can y'all please create that What'd be great is if somebody just like, you know, knew exactly what I was thinking and then I'd be like, mm, and then it would just go on the piece of paper. But actually, no, I don't, I can't, unless somebody else knows, I don't know any like manual offers. 
Does anybody have like an offer system that's like maybe a CRM or something? Because I do not know that. And actually, I'm not really that type of a person. Like I'm the type of person like, and my offer page is just like an offer sheet. I mean, just like, it's kind of like a letter. It's like, Dill Seller, here's my five offers. And blah, 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 blah. And I write them out. And when I do that, it kind of has me to think about it as well, too. It's very bubblegum brain, all right? Does anybody know the difference between brick brain and bubblegum brain? I teach my daughter this. Brick brain, brain is like, I don't want to, like, I'm just going to sit around and watch TV. Like, a lot of people just sitting around watching Netflix right now, right? You guys are awesome because y'all are here because this is bubblegum brain. Bubblegum brain is where you're like, I don't know what the hell she's talking about right now, but I am going to totally figure this out, right? That's bubblegum brain, okay? And brick brain is like, I don't even give a shit about what she's talking about right now because right now Tiger King is on and I'd rather watch that than Tiger King, okay? So that's the difference between bubble gum, bubble gum and brick brain. I just, it's actually growth mindset and fixed mindset is really what it is. Uh, but I teach bubble gum brain and brick brain because that's what Lillian does. All the time she's like, I don't want to do bubble gum brain. I want to do brick brain. And I'm like, too bad. Go do some bubble gum brain. You can't watch any videos right now. Um, do you have a system to generate five different offers? No, because every single offer is completely different of every single else, every single one. So like, there's no like, oh, I'm going to only be doing this. These are my five offers. Like, no, it's like you could do five owner finance offers because what if they like, no, like, like I literally went to like, I went to go talk to a storage facility owner and like, he was like, yes, I want to sell. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I could pay you like what $200,000 cash. He's like, no, I'm not going to pay. I don't want your money. He's like, I'm going to be the bank. And then we started negotiating. We came up with like five or 10 different. I was like, well, what about this? So you could literally, your offers could be like five, like owner finance still offers. Right. So there's no one structure for every deal. What you have to learn is every single one of them. You have to become a transaction engineer. You have to understand that you have, you have to make, for every single one, it's a case-by-case -case method. It's a case-by-case -case study is what it is. So I wish it was easier than that, but it's just not. All right, so you've got to learn it. Samantha, thank you. Peace out. Okay, all right. Anybody else? This is the longest webinar in the whole world. All right, anybody else? Any final questions? I feel like it's so overwhelming that I'm just frozen, so I have brain freeze. I'm definitely going to get into your member, uh, your mentoring course. Thank you, Stacy, for all this information. You're welcome, right? Yes, this is what mentors are for. As I said, I got the experience. You might as well just talk to somebody about it, right? Is anybody listening to me? Because I feel like I'm still just, oh my gosh, there's still 53 people on here. I feel like I'm just rambling on and on, all right? But essentially, that's what a mentor is for, is to teach you this kind of stuff, right? This is difficult. But in this market, this is what you got to learn. Right? This is it. I'm telling you, if you learn this stuff, you're going to be awesome. You're going to be awesome. All right. So yeah, what's coming up in the next mastermind is I have, a, I have somebody coming to speak about how much money he made in the downturn, which is like millions and millions of dollars in the last downturn. He came in, he literally had no money. And um, now he's like, he, oh, he's probably, he's probably worth like $10 million. That's how much he made in the last, from, from the downturn to now. And um, so he's going to come, he's going to be a special guest in our uh, mastermind. And what he did, I'm telling you, is exactly what I'm teaching you. I'm telling you, this is what he did. All right. So um, I think that would be awesome. I'm going to have him come speak at one of the, uh, the meetings as well. So I get like, you know, people like this at the meeting. Okay, whatever. What else? Oh my gosh, Seanette's still on here. You guys are still listening to this. All right. So what else should I talk about? Anybody else? Oh my gosh, there's more questions. Thanks, Stacy. Your course material is very good stuff. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, as always. I'll schedule a strategy session with you. I'm serious. You and our your platform. Awesome. I love it. Okay, good. I'm so glad that all this resonated with you. Hopefully it gives you an eye-opening experience as of what you have to do. I already told you what you should be focusing on. Marketing, creative deal structuring, wholesaling, and private money lending. These are the four things that you should be focusing on right now. All right. And if you do not know how to do how to, how to do though, if you do not know how to do those, then get a coach. I will teach you how to do this stuff. All right. And um, I think that's it. I'm exhausted. You guys have worn me out. All right.
Anybody else? Let me go through these. Okay, good. Everybody's putting everything in. All right, I'm exhausted. Y'all have a good night. Uh, oops. Yep. Uh, y'all have a good night, and I will and I will talk to y'all in the in this, the implementation implementation strategy sessions. Okay. I'm done. I'm done. I'm out. Bye. Bye, guys. I put my I'm gonna put my my camera over here so I, I don't look all weird. Bye. Wait. Let me do stop share. Okay, I'm out. Bye, guys. Thank you for showing up. And uh, take care of yourself. Stay safe. And um, that's it. That's it. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.